You may be seated. Well, it's almost here. We've almost made it. November 5th. It's you know, Tuesday. It's coming. Whew. The elders have asked me over these last three weeks to speak about what the Bible has to say about this issue of politics. And I'm, I'm going to go off script here for a minute, which is, my wife will tell you, always dangerous. Um, this was a challenge for me. And maybe it was a challenge for you. I opened when we did the first question, now three weeks ago, and I said, maybe you saw the table in the, the lobby, and maybe you went, oh, yuck, oh, no, or maybe you went, oh, yay, all right, and, and it became this whole political thing, and, and you're wrestling with it in one way or another, and you're trying to decide if this is good or bad, and you're not sure. Well, so here, here's what happened for me, which I think is a good thing. When the elders came to me and said, we want you to speak about what the Bible says about these political issues, it has forced me to put my theology of elections and politics out in front of all of you. And when you do that, you sort of have to dial it in and make sure you've got it right in your own mind before you step into God's pulpit and speak to his people. And so I've been wrestling with these three questions, and I think it's been really good because I believe that the Bible speaks to all aspects of life and death to God's glory. And this is one of the aspects of my life that we're dealing with in your life, and it's a pretty big deal in what we're dealing with. So the Bible must have something to speak to it. So we started with, what does the Bible say about voting? That was our first question. The second question, what does the Bible have to say about ballot initiatives when we're asked to engage in those. And now here we are with the third question. What does the Bible say about selecting our government leaders? Now, in a hot take, you might be tempted to just say it. <laughs> it, it doesn't, because the form of government we live under didn't exist in Jesus' day, and therefore, the Bible doesn't speak to it at all, sort of like, you know, speed limits in cars and, you know, that kind of thing. We could say this, but I think, much like our other two questions, I think the Bible has principles here that do speak into what we are dealing with, even under our form of government that's different than what Jesus had in our day and time. There are biblical principles here that can inform us in our journey as we walk faithfully with the Lord. So, that being said, I think the principle that, that I would like us to take a look at is found in Jeremiah Chapter 29, verses 4 through 7. That's where I'd like us to go. And as you're making your way there, I just want to give you a little background. God's people, the Israelites, had turned their back on God. They had disobeyed God over and over and over again. And, and he was gracious and patient and slow with them. And yet, as he promised, he eventually came and said, all right, enough's enough. I'm going to remove you from your land. So he raised up a conquering army, Babylon in this case, to come and take the land and take all the people and haul them off into captivity. They the, the strategy of that day was to take all these people to a land they were not familiar with. So they hauled them back to Babylon. And this was because of their unfaithfulness. And now they're there. They're probably trying to make sense of it all. They're saying, what happened? The dust is settling. And the prophet Jeremiah, who speaks for the Lord, sent them a word. And that's where we're going to pick this up now, starting in verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give them to your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. God could have sent him a message that said, 
Start a guerrilla warfare effort. Fight from within. Hold strong. Or he could have said, make every effort to escape. You don't belong there. It's a wicked and unjust government. Get out. He didn't say that at all. That was not the instruction he gave to these people. Instead, he says, listen, go ahead and build houses. Go ahead and plant a garden. What does that say? You're going to be here for a while. In fact, go ahead and have kids. And then when those kids are grown, marry off those kids to other kids and have grandkids. He's saying you need to settle in. You need to trust me. Because at God's hand, under God's control, they were there for 70 years. And he says something that I find so informative to them as they're just getting started in this exile in Babylon. I find it so fascinating as we think about where we're at in this world on our journey to the eternal city. We're just passing through. This is not our home. Not as it is. It will be in the new heavens and new earth, but not today. We're passing through. And he says this to these people who are also in exile in verse 7. He says, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Do you see what he did? He said, if it goes well for them, it'll go well for you. All right, so so in This city is where you will find your blessing, so you better be looking after the well-being of that city. That's an interesting principle, isn't it? That's a really fascinating deal because Babylon was completely wicked, completely sinful, completely anti-God. In fact, they sacked God's people and destroyed the temple and made a mockery of everything about these people and their God, everything. And yet, yet, God said, that's where I'm going to put you. Now, 70 years was judgment on the people. They were in sort of a really big timeout so they could get their head on straight and go, oh, we, we need to turn back to the Lord. And yet, God still said, your well-being and your welfare is tied to the welfare of your captor's city. So trust me in this. Pray for this city. Pray for them. Seek the welfare of the city. Seek is an active word seek the welfare of the city. This means they couldn't just be passive, couldn't just sit back and do nothing. They couldn't say, you know, not my circus, not my monkeys, not my thing. They couldn't just sit back and put their feet up and just say, I'm just going to watch it all burn to the ground. I'm out. God commanded them to seek ways, to look for, to actively find ways to do good to the city to bless the city, even this wicked and wretched place where God had put them. Seek ways to be a blessing. And so now we're not in the same exact circumstances as the Israelites were. We're not in here as captives in this land. But still, this land is not our ultimate home. We're just passing through. And so I think the principle remains true for us. God's people seek the welfare of the city where God has placed them. That's what he's asking us to do. Now, there's lots of ways to seek the well-being and the welfare of the cities where we live. Now, some of you I recognize, you think you get a free pass because you live a million miles outside of town. I've gone to some of your houses. Like, God put me in the country. I think think you need to look after the well-being of maybe the city that's closest to you and your neighbors up and down these these long, straight roads. And I think God wants us to look after the well-being of our county and after the well-being of our state and after the the well-being of our nation. I don't think anybody here gets a free pass. This principle should be ringing true in our ears as we're looking for ways to bless our city and as we're being asked to select our government leaders. I think this principle should be in the back of our mind. We should say, which leaders on this ballot are going to be best for the welfare of my community, of my city, and of my county, and and of my state, and of the nation. Which of these individuals will be a blessing to this place? We need to probably be thinking about that. Who's going to manage well? Who's going to manage best? Who's going to do what's best for the city? 
Now, I've chatted with people over the years. I've been involved in politics. I did my undergraduate in politics. I, I find it interesting, and I like to have conversations, but maybe not the same conversations that you like to have. I'm always curious about the process. I've talked to a lot of people who go and vote, and they have absolutely no idea who's on the ballot for almost any of the offices that are up for election. Okay, sure, they get the national one because of all the commercials, because it interrupts all our entertainment on our screens, and, you know, I get it. Or because it's on talk radio, or because it's the talk of the town, and everybody's talking about that. Or maybe a state race, maybe. Maybe a Senate race. Maybe something that's got everybody's attention. But for the most part, they have no idea who's running for various city council slots, um, the retention of judges, things in the county, school boards, no clue, no clue at all. So they walk in to vote, and what do they do? What do we do? Maybe you've done this. We flip a coin. We just go after a name that sounds like something that sounds nice. That guy's got a cool name. I'll go with that. I mean, what do we do? So here's the problem. Is flipping a coin actively seeking the welfare of our community? Actively saying I'm doing my part to understand how to look after what's best for my community? I don't think it is. I really don't think it is. So here, here's what we've done. I want to be able to help all of us live out these principles of the Bible that we would know live and proclaim the gospel. So this is the live part, to help you live this out if you want to. If you're going to go to vote, and you know what, we hope you do. If you're going to do that, there are sample ballots. I printed the whole bundle that I got from the courthouse here in Phelps County. It's the sample ballot that we'll look at. You're going to need to figure out, I mean, it's got some of the races that won't be your races, but it's got our community seats that are being selected. Go out and take a look at it. Do a little bit of work before. Be prepared so that you can seek the well-being of a city. Find out who these people are who are looking to manage and run our communities. I think, I think if we're going to follow this, we need to do that. You know, I was surprised when I, when I got the sample ballot and I started looking over it. Do you know how many local races only have one person running? It's not even an election. It's just one person. And at first I thought, well, maybe that's because, you know, all these people in Nebraska are so intimidating, they run off all the competition or something. But then I saw City Council Ward 1 here in Holdridge. You know when people are running for that race? None. None. Some of you live in Ward 1. And you should be terrified because we've all conspired to write your name in the line and then you're going to have to do the job. I'm just <laughs> I don't think that's how it works, but, but whatever. We should be so grateful for the people who've been willing to come and manage our community and do the hard work that's there. And hopefully they're going to be looking after the well-being of the city. Hopefully they're, they're good people that would do well in this community, but we need to pray for them because that's what this text also said. Pray for these people. It must be a hard job if nobody wants to do it. And if you live in, you know, City Council Ward 1, maybe we should stand up and say, hey, put my name in there. I'll do the job. I don't know. We need to be thankful for the people who are doing this hard work in our local communities and in our local races. And we need to figure out who's going to do well in these other races where there are a number of people that we need to select some from. We need to look after the well-being of our community. But listen, it's not just about our immediate physical well-being. There was a lot more going on here with uh, God and the Israelites. There's a lot more going on here with us. It's much bigger than just this physical thing. Jeremiah 29, where we were just reading, if we were to look at 11 through 13, just a little bit further down from where we reread, it gives us a glimpse of how. This is the how the exile in Babylon was going to be good for the Israelites. It was how God was working. It was how he was shaping them. It was sort of the why this whole exile itself. It says this, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for your welfare. There's that word again. And not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. This whole thing. 
was something that was so much better than what they could have had physically. It was that they would have God. Having God, following Jesus is the better welfare, walking in his ways, having salvation. That's the better thing. That's the best welfare and well-being we can have. And that's what God was seeking for them. And you know what? The New Testament picks up this idea. And it carries it forward even to us. Acts 17, 26 through 27 says this. God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. God chose where we live so that we would know God and that people would find him. And maybe he put you where he put you so that you could help others to feel their way to God. Or maybe he put you where he put you so that you might reach out from your blind state and find God. We're passing through here. We've been put here for a purpose. And as we seek after the well-being of the city, we should be seeking after this bigger well-being. So Christians, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to think about these three questions that we've looked at and these principles as you think about your your ballot, or as you even consider if you're going to vote or not. Election is but one more way to seek the welfare of our city and our state and our nation. And maybe, I'm just maybe, God might take all of this when it's all said and done, no matter what happens next Tuesday and after that and all the courts and all the other stuff that's probably going to happen. After all that, God may use that to draw people to himself. Amen to change their citizenship from here to a citizen of the eternal city for God's glory. Let's pray. Lord, as we, as a nation, are being asked to to vote, as we, as a people, are being asked to look after the well-being of our city, God, I ask that you would equip us to do that well, that we would uh, have your, your discernment, and Lord, that you would bring blessing on our community, that our well-being tied with the well-being of where we live, Lord, would be good. And God, may we remember Christ in all of this, that we would put the gospel first in all of it and have an opportunity, Lord, to represent our true King, King Jesus, as we keep our eye on that eternal city and on your glory. It's in Jesus' name.